It was a bunch of people that you could tell really loved each other. It was a very caring environment. What about these people here? They think I'm the son of God. They believed that the end of the world is coming soon and that they were going to be in a battle with the federal government. They were amassing enough armaments to outfit a small army. The ultimate goal was to arrest David Koresh and to seize all of the illegal weapons. media, this is a big damn story. Very ugly situation, almost a warlike zone going on there. Get that camera out of here! Get out of here! Get that out of here! David made such statements as, we are ready for war. Okay, y'all been preparing eight months for this. How long do you think we've been preparing? I don't think there's any question she's coming out. She's coming, she's coming out. out. As a negotiator, our goal was always saving as many lives as you can. We have moved in, we've taken that turf, and when I'll leave it. We got children in there. Let's work on getting these kids out. They came in and attacked us. It definitely was not us that shot first. You could have dropped a bomb on us and we would not have come out. We'll see one of the holes here. David knew he was dying. If he died, game over. They believed that David Koresh was the key to their eternal salvation. A lot of people have told me that he was trying to groom me. There's no doubt that David Koresh had sex with young kids. The whole time we were having sex, it was a Bible study. That's insanity. If I pull the trigger, the leader's dead. The kids are safe. They all come out. It's over. Do you put your trust in the Lord? I am the Lord. That was the trailer for the Netflix docuseries, Waco, American Apocalypse. And this is Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. In February 1993, outside of Waco, Texas, cult leader David Koresh faced off against the U.S. federal government in a bloody 51-day siege. The conflict began with the biggest gunfight on American soil since the Civil War and ended with a fiery inferno captured live on national television. In between, it riveted TV viewers across the globe, becoming the biggest news story in the world. The docuseries features exclusive access to recently unearthed videotapes filmed inside the FBI Crisis Negotiation Unit, as well as raw news footage never before released to the American public. Join us as we talk with the series' acclaimed director and producer, Tiller Russell, about finding the human stories amidst this uniquely American tragedy. Stay tuned. Tiller Russell, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? They are great. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you taking the time and interest. Yeah, well, no, it's it's, it's our pleasure. Thanks again. Uh, to remind our listeners, we're talking with uh, Tilla Russell, the producer and director of Waco, American Apocalypse, an original Netflix docuseries that's currently streaming. Uh, so, yeah, welcome again to Factual America. Congratulations. I see it's doing quite well. Uh, has been uh, doing quite well on Netflix. It's always on one of the most watched lists, at least when I'm um, looking at it here in the UK. Um, so, I mean, why don't you get us started? What is uh, what is Waco American Apocalypse all about? Well, I think that Waco is this kind of iconic American tragedy that um, took place in Waco, Texas, 1993, where the a group called the Branch Davidians, which was this sect sort of splinter group from the Seventh Day Adventist, ended up, you know, holding up essentially in this compound. The federal government, the ATF, came in, tried to kind of kick down the doors, raid it because they were amassing this arsenal, this stockpile of weapons, and 
what ended up happening was it, it it sort of what jumped off was the the largest gunfight on American soil since the Civil War. And then what followed was a 51 day siege in which the Branch Davidians hold up inside and the FBI came in, attempted to negotiate the release of various hostages. And then it ends in this tragic fire where, um, you know, countless people, 80 something people end up, uh, you know, burning to their deaths in the end. And I think it's this it's the story that has kind of haunted in some ways it's a ghost story i think it's kind of haunted america and the world in a fundamental sense and so we went back in to kind of tackle this and see if we could approach it with a more humanist lens if that yes. makes sense no i think that does i mean i think you you raise a that's an excellent synopsis uh i have seen the three episodes and uh um really really Enjoyed is a hard way of is a difficult way of putting it, but uh, and in a sense, I did enjoy it. But it is a diff- it is an American tragedy, and I think when I talk to people about this, and as someone who was born and raised in in Texas, actually, and I've got some indirect connections to that part, literally that that part of the world. My mom grew up just about fifteen miles away from where that all happened. Um, but it's. You know, at the time, I don't know about for you, but it, it's it's one of these things where we kind of like some of us. I mean, maybe put it in the context how this just absolutely. I mean, maybe a lot of people won't realize this of, of a certain age. This really gripped a nation at the time. It, it was it was the biggest story in the world, and it was the biggest story in the world for fifty one days. And I too grew up in Texas, right? I, I grew up in Dallas, not far away from okay. it. Okay, and um, and so I too have those you know those roots that kind of like tie back to the story in some sense or another, and. What happened was the the 24 hour news cycle jumped on this story. A, it happened live on television, right? So l- literally, the gunfight was captured by this reporter, you know, local small town reporter, who stumbled in this into the story of a lifetime and actually was caught in the middle of this massive, you know, ATF raid and gunfight, and. The footage from that was broadcast and sort of beamed almost instantaneously around the world. And it went from being this very parochial local story Mm -hmm. to this object of fascination for the media and for the world. And because it failed to resolve quickly, I mean, I think... Uh, that's one of the things that that continued to captivate people. Normally, when you have a barricade situation or a standoff situation, it's this very intense ticking clock, and there's a resolution. Either people come out or people get shot up and 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 die. And but it gets resolved quickly. And this like grinded into this extended and mm. very dramatic standoff that just continued and continued and continued, and then had this real real-time ending where the world was just watching stunned to think that there were you know all of these children um and then i think it's the children specifically that that haunt us as a culture that are you know burning to death inside this compound while there are tanks arrayed outside of it and there are the news cameras you know broadcasting it in real time and so it was this kind of you know, slow motion car crash yeah, slash yeah, white knuckle yeah. thriller happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and it is you, you say early days of twenty four seven news coverage, and I don't know about you, but I remember exactly where it was. Uh, TV seemed to be ubiquitous, and diff- I was in school, and uh, you know, looked over, and they were actually showing the uh, the actual, you know, that that morning or the nineteenth of April. The just, and you just kind of, you didn't know what to make of it. You just, you know, it was these, t- I mean, and your documentary does such an amazing job of, I'd forgotten. I mean, they've got Abrams tanks, <laughs> they've well, got, it, you know, it, out parked out front of this compound. It, it, it is this astonishing visual when you look back on it. You know, you don't see... Um, you know, literally Abrams tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles arrayed around, you know, civilians and just, you know, this uh, cow field in the middle of Texas. And so there was something so visually kind of stunning and arresting and also jarring. And then at the Mm -hmm. same time, you know, when that story was happening in, in real time, there was no window into the lives of the people in the compound, right? Right? Mm. The cameras were always outside and we were looking at it and looking at it from a distance. Mm. So there wasn't a level of kind of, 
you know, intimacy. And I think that's what we tried to achieve with the series is like, okay, how do we now kind of revisit this, but bring it to life and we show the very complicated, complex uh, inner lives of all the people whose stories intersected at Waco in this, in this, in this crazy tragedy. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a very, very fair, and very good point because I mean, I, I hate to say it at the time, it's kind of like, well, there, yeah, there's these crazy people outside Waco and this happened and yeah, we hear there's children involved and they're at danger. So yeah, okay, it's fine. Federal government needs to go in all barrels blazing and whatever. And then it's, you talk about it now, 30 years on, and people are like, can you believe that actually happened? You know, I mean, believe me, there's plenty of people at fault, and we, you know, you're, and it's discussed in your doc about David Koresh and what was maybe or maybe not going on in there, but still, it's, it's, it's something that, I think it's only with the passage of time that we've just realized how, how, I don't know, kind of immune or nerd we were to it at the time and how it's just you know and now it's still gripping us to, as you say it's like this ghost story that haunts you the the u.s and it's still with it, us today it's you know i'm a big believer in the passage of time for kind of being a necessity to retell these stories in a way that adds depth and nuance to them. Mm -hmm. There's something about when something is happening in real time, you're getting a a surface level version of the events, right? And everybody yeah. is struggling to make sense of it. And I think, you know, one of the things that so um that we forget about Waco is Nothing like this had ever happened before. So the FBI had no idea what they were doing. They were in this uncharted territory. The ATF, the people inside the compound, the the news media had never seen anything like this. So everybody was just grappling, trying to make sense of it in this rapidly escalating, very volatile, dangerous situation. And so I think there is kind of a gift to history and some distance from the actual events because a it gives people an opportunity to emotionally intellectually perhaps spiritually process the events that they lived through and to have some measure of reflection upon what those were and to have the kind of the power of hindsight to revisit it and yet at the same time for all of these people like it's the worst, most dramatic, most horrifying days of their lives. So it's seared into their memories in a way that's unforgettable. So as a filmmaker, when you when you enter into something like this, you want it to feel like a real time, you know, white knuckle thriller that's unfolding before your very eyes. But you also want to layer in the distance that you get and the perspective that you get with some separation and time. And so I'm a big believer in the necessity of that to really get at the the heart and the humanity of, of the stories like this one. I've heard, we had a filmmaker on once say, he said, it was about 20 years is what you need for a lot of these sort of stories. But in some ways, I think 30 seems probably better in this case. I, I don't know. Um, it, I think it depends on the story, but there, there is a, you know, there's a, there's a benchmark that you, I mean, in, 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 you know, previous films and series that I've done, sometimes it's, you know, they're crime stories. So you're waiting for the statute of limitations to expire so that people right. can really tell the contours of what it is. But I think whether it's 10 years, whether it's 20 years, whether it's 30 years, you need, um, enough distance that there is some reflection on it and yet it can't be so much time that the memories are dissipating and no longer as vivid as they once were so it's finding that sweet spot and it's also i'm kind of a believer in that these stories get told when they're supposed to be told you can't force mm. things to happen you 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 kind of there's a receptivity that's required um where the story has to want to be told and the people have to want to come forward and they have to entrust you with these precious moments and memories. Mm -hmm. And so things kind of events and, 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 and the retellings of them have their own, I think, organic rhythm to them. Okay. I think we're going to uh, actually uh, 
give our audience a very early and quick uh, uh, break here. But we'll be right back with uh, Tiller Russell, the producer and director of the Netflix docuseries Waco American Apocalypse. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Tiller Russell, the producer and director of the Netflix docuseries, Awaco American Apocalypse. Um, you were talking about, uh, we were talking about the passage of time and how that's necessary for perspective and, um, you know, uh, to tell, you, well, whatever pa- passage of time is needed is what is required to tell the story, basically. Um, now, I mean, when you've, you've already talked about sort of the unique perspective you're trying to bring to this. I mean, um, there are already four, or at least four, uh, previous doc features, right, on this? I mean, what is it, how do you, what, this new ground you're covering, how did you go about that? Because uh, you obviously didn't want to rehash what others had done, and you do have the benefit of time. So, uh, I mean, I think one thing that struck me, str- has struck me, is, uh, is the interviews with the former members. Um, and, um, I mean, how was that? That is, that's some incredible, uh, poignant um, uh, film there that you've got with these people who are who have survived. You know they weren't one of the eighty two that that passed away and are, are able to now tell their story. Well, it. Um, I actually was very cautious and and had a lot of trepidation of, about approaching the story for exactly the reason that you said, which is yeah. this is a story that has been told and retold, you know, numerous times. It was told in the front pages of the paper. It was told live on television as it's breaking, and then it was you know retold in, in sort of subsequent you know long form versions of it, books, yeah. whatever else. And so I was very. Um, I had a great. It gave me a great pause early on as to whether or not to, you know, whether or not to tackle this and to tackle something that was so um, iconic, I suppose, in a way. And what ended up happening, I think, there were there were sort of two fundamental um, elements that drew me in. One was there was this new footage which had been uncovered, right. which was, you know, inside the FBI's hostage negotiation room, right? And that the world had never seen it and they'd never seen the mechanics of it. And so that drew me more deeply into the story. And I thought, okay, wow, this is something that I've never seen, that the world Mm. has never seen, and that is a new window into the story. But to the point that you were raising is what I also found was all of these people who lived through this story and and lived to tell the tale were not who I expected them to be. And... um. And I feel like the story has been told in a very oftentimes politicized or weaponized way where mm. it's like, who's who screwed this up and and, and a kind of a blame, blame game and finger pointing. And of course, there's there's countless failures, like un- unquestionably. Uh, but but what I was struck by was the humanity of the people and and, and the people on all sides of it. So with the mm. Branch Davidians, it was, you know, I met the woman heather jones who was nine years old at the time that this uh un- that these events unfolded and i remember asking her in that interview how much do you remember and she said i remember everything it's like a film is playing in my mind and that was the first you know interview question that i asked and i could see how i could see the wheels turning i could almost mm-hmm. feel the you know the film reel in her mind and i thought because you don't know, like you're a kid, right? Have you repressed this? Have you sort of pushed it away? Have you gone yeah. running from this, or do you, or is it like burned in there? And for her, it was clearly burned in there. And so I found that um, uh, scary and fascinating and incredibly moving. And then same thing with some of the other folks, whether it's um, you know David Tebedo, who was. Yeah. Uh, Koresh's rock and roll drummer, right? And sort of meets him at the Sunset Strip in LA and um, at Guitar Center and wasn't looking for God, wasn't looking for, you know, history, was just looking Mm -hmm. to play in a rock and roll band and then kind of ended up in this, um, 
you know, drawn into the with into the force field of this story and, and Koresh's magnetism, or Kathy Schroeder, you know, the woman who was uh, purported to be one of David Koresh's mighty men, and right. who ends up, you know, having to decide whether to come out to be with her kids and to release her kids along the way, and whoever they were, I. I and whatever their stories were that led them to it, I actually found them all oddly brave to be willing to come forward and share their authentic experiences about the paths that had led them to it and the choices that they made and the impact it had had on their lives. And so I found that very um, moving and fascinating. I think, yeah, it was someone like... Uh... I mean, I, I agree. I think someone like Kathy, I mean, there's the, I guess I get the impression I had was there are the ways, you, there are the way they're supposed to supposedly answer questions, and then there's the way they authentically answer the questions. So someone like her, she comes across as maybe even, maybe is still a believer. I mean, um, and how do they, I mean, how does someone like her reconcile what happens with what her beliefs may be? with regards to being part of this, uh, you know, the, this branch Davidians? Well, I think, you know, how I always approach these, you know, any interview, but particularly something that is as sensitive and volatile as this is, hey, I'm genuinely curious what it's like to live through something of this yeah. level of intensity. And what the hell was it really like? What's running through your mind? What's running through your heart? Like, how do you, what are the steps that lead you there? What are, you know, what's, what are the hopes and fears? And I think when people, I hope anyway, that when people understand there is a genuine curiosity and fascination and a lack of judgment on my part, mm. um, that it's, it, hopefully it provides like a vessel and a window to like, explain the human experience because to me that's where the juice of it is right like it's a story about god and guns and their impact on on kids you know and, and those are all the things that suck you in to the story as being provocative and controversial and explosive but at the end of the day hopefully what keeps you there is it's about the human experience. It's about what it means to be alive and to die and to watch people that you love die and and and, and to 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 hopefully map the kind of emotional complexity of that. And and speaking of which, it's not just the uh, members of the uh, Branch Davidians. You've got the uh, ATF agents and the the sniper from the uh, hostage uh, rescue teams. It's talking, which is also incredible. Um, uh, cinema as well, especially what's what's the fellow's name from ATF uh, Buford? I mean, he yeah, Bill Bill, Bill Buford, and 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 to 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 return to to what you were saying before, which is all of these people brought this profound authenticity to it and also vulnerability to it. Mm. You know, it's not often you don't expect to see somebody from the ATF. Uh, you know, crying about watching, you know, loved ones uh, mm. or, or fellow colleagues getting, you know, shot in front of them. But the trauma was so, you know, just beneath the surface with, you know, Jim Cavanaugh, for example, who mm. was the ATF, um, you know, one of the commanding officers there or Bill Buford, who's this, you know, one of these kind of door kicking ATF guys. Right. And you know, this is a guy that's seen combat, you know, Vietnam veteran, mm. been through, you know, the the most intense raw combat experiences that you can that you can possibly have as a human being and survive. And yet, you know, for him, Waco was vividly alive, you know, to this day, those memories and the questions and watching his, you know, young protege, you know, get shot down so that he could survive. Um it burned so brightly for these people that whoever they were, or whether it's Chris Whitcomb from the uh, you know hostage yeah. rescue H FBI's hostage rescue team, this guy was not who I expected him to be. You know, you yeah. think sniper, okay, this guy's going to be ass kicker, you know, right. badass, and you know, and whatever. And instead, and he is all those things unquestionably, but he was also somebody that was writing poetry throughout the entire mm. experience and deeply engaging with David Koresh's theology to see if there was something real there or not. Mm. And so mm. it 
because the people were not who I expected to meet and my experience, like I was so shocked and some periodically made uncomfortable or moved by their stories. Mm. I wanted, you know, hopefully to transmit that to the audience, um, to remind them that we're all human beings, you know, and like whoever you are, whatever your sort of politics and religious beliefs and upbringing are is, we're all just people trying to get through the day and to do our best. Yeah. I mean, I thought that was incredible with Bill Buford. I mean, I, just the, the the picture of uh, him saying that they uh, going in, they're all holding hands, and right, they're just squeezing each other's hands to know, to just let each other know that they're there. You just don't think of that kind of stuff with these guys, as you say, these door kicking ATF agents. You know, it's those. It's those. I'm glad that you brought that up because it's those little human moments that remind you like man we're all scared and we're yeah. all you know yeah. confused and you know those hand squeezes going back through as they're rolling up into you know n- n- what it's going to be or you know it that also reminds me of the memory that the reporter you know John Macklemore shares mm. of seeing one of the ATF guys afterwards whose whose wedding ring has you know co- right. about to come off his finger and it and it's these little details that are the texture of the humanity of these folks that aren't mm. they're not about plot it's not about narrative it's right. about character and humanity and so that to me is the real stuff and texture of it that you have to really um fight to protect in the edit to acknowledge the humanity of these folks yeah. and you were mentioning earlier the two things that drove this and one of the and and was something i did want to discuss with you which which was this uh never before seen footage that you had from the uh, from the uh, FBI. I mean, how do you how do you learn about that footage or how do you uncover that and how do you get access to stuff like that? You know, it's 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 interesting. At, at this point in a weird way, many of these stories find me as opposed to me finding the stories. And um, in this case, it, what had happened was the FBI's assumption when they rolled in after the gunfight to take over for for the ATF, uh, their assumption was, okay, we're going to get the, everybody out in 24 hours. It'll all be said and done. Everybody goes home heroes, and we'll use this as a teaching tool you know, back at Quantico to instruct mm-hmm. other people that are coming up how to – navigate a situation like this so there's a video camera that's circulating as they're you know putting together the hostage negotiation room and as they're making the phone calls and passing each other post-it notes and documenting that process and then what happens happens which is it goes horribly awry completely out of everybody's control and someone makes the decision let's put this in a box, put it in the top of the closet and pretend like it doesn't exist for 30 years. Right. And, um, and then one day, you know, cut to 30 years later, somebody takes down that box and, you know, pulls out these tapes and is like, holy shit, this is <laughs> like the world has never seen this. You know, right. what is this? And so in that case, it was my producers who had gotten a hold of this material and they called me about it. And, like I said, I was initially like, no, I don't want to do Waco. I feel like it's been done. I, you know, right. I, I'm, this is uh, kind of dangerous territory to be treading on. But that was a window into something new and the mechanics of hostage negotiation, which we have all of our Hollywood notions of what that is, right? It's hmm. Sam Jackson on the phone, one right. dude, you know, talking him out. <laughs> and instead, it, it's not, it's this team of people that are yeah. uh, like, on the one hand, trying to manipulate folks out. On the other hand, very well intentioned. They're trying to save lives, but there is this subterfuge that's involved in it. And so, those complex dynamics really felt um, fascinating to me. Yeah. And I think it, uh, in other ways, it provides an interesting insight. And I was talking to someone earlier about this. Um, and I know you do. You've done some. You've done true crime. Um, and I'm not. I'm not saying anything about the lens you were seeing things through, but how law enforcement seldom comes off looking very good in a lot of these <laughs> these things, these series. And what is it? I mean, or is it the fog of war, or what? What? What is going on? Because you had this. Situ- in this case, um, there seemed to be 
two very different views of how to handle this, and they were going their own way and didn't really seem to be anyone control calling the shots, you know. But I'll let you say say more on that. Well, I think that we tend to, you know, if you're not if you're not in that world, if you're not from, you know, a, a member of law enforcement or the military or whatever it may be, we tend to think of these things as civilians as these like monolithic institutions that are um one single thing and really what it is is it's just a collection of people fbi agents and yeah. every one of them are, are you know is an atom in 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 the molecule that right. that is, is the fbi right and so um a there's the humanity and individuality of each person and then b there are these conflicting currents within the fbi right you've got the hostage rescue team and their mandate is kill the bad guys get the good guys mm. and get them out and rescue them. And it's a very um, task oriented kind of militaristic outlook mm. for which when that's necessary, it's the last backstop. Like those right. are the people you want yeah. to go in when that happens. And then on the other hand, you've got this massive kind of chasm at the time between the hostage rescue team and the negotiators who believe that it could take a hundred years. That's fine. And if we're on the phone for a hundred years negotiating, right. as right. long as everybody comes out peacefully, that's the right path. And so there's this, these divergent tactics and methodologies and and I, and I don't even think you can fault the bosses in a sense because yeah. you've got you know these different factions and different people whispering in your ear, let's do this. You've got the massive scrutiny of like the media there. You've mm. got a ticking clock where money's going out the door every day and you are having to make the best decisions that you can in impossible circumstances. And you've got the attorney general asking you every day what's happening and she's being asked – by the president, why is this still ongoing? And uh, I can only and, and and you've got this disconnect from the people that are on the ground. Like right. it's one thing to be staring at David Koresh through a sniper rifle, like okay, I can take the shot, and it's another right. thing to be in the White House, being like, what in the hell is going on in Waco? Yeah. Like, right, and what's right, the exactly. plan? You know. Exactly. So the the kind of the disconnect between the field and and command, and and the chain of command between them. Yeah. And then, I mean, you had Ruby Ridge the year before, I think, and stuff like that. But it just uh, those early nine, early to mid nineties. It kind of a lot of this uh, you forget, but a lot of these things were kicking off at the time. Well, and then you have Waco. I mean, you, have, you have Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, City. Yeah. two years later, right? So, like Ruby Ridge, Waco, Oklahoma City. That is, uh, you know, there is a continuity to those stories continuity in terms of personnel continuity in terms of like the politics and the decision making behind them and the legacy of them and i think that in a way much of the the kind of discord in society now or the distrust of the federal government or whatever all mm. these things are that are roiling the culture a lot of that stuff this is ground zero this is the moment where those um, chasms in the culture begin to open up. Yeah. And what makes, I mean, I, on a side note, I once back, I think this is like 97. I was, as I said, I got some Texas roots. I was visiting my aunt and uncle and they made a point of taking my brother and I are by the compound where, you know, afterwards. And then within 24 hours, I was in Oklahoma city in front of the, uh, the FBI building. I mean, it was just, uh, Quite and there and there is you know. there is something in the ground in those sites. Like I'm a I'm a believer in 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 something staying behind in the kind of you know if not the DNA then at least in the DNA of the culture in those places they become you know resonant uh, haunted or you know or hallowed depending upon your politics right, like right. spaces right yeah. of okay this is where it happened and. and and I, 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 I remember having that same experience when I was making Night Stalker, right. where I went through and I mapped all of the places and people who Richard Ramirez had attacked and drove through those locales at night. And it was very, it was very haunting to be, you know, at two in the morning, recognizing this is the place where this murder happened or that mm. murder happened. Yeah. And it's called... Uh, American Apocalypse is the sub 
sort of subtitle. What makes it Waco uniquely American, you think? Well, I think that you know, it goes back to that notion of it's God, it's guns, it's America, it's children at the center of it. There are these fundamental issues, right, which is the right to worship the way you want, the constitutional right to bear arms, which are at the kind of boiling center of this. Without those two elements, this conflict doesn't exist. And those are you know, foundational issues to America, right? right? They were there when this country began. They'll be here when, you know, when it when it ends. But yeah. uh, this is a moment where you see those intersecting spokes come together in a vol in a really volatile powder keg of a situation. Yeah. And what do you hope the series legacy is when it's all said and done? Well, in increasingly my hope is to tell every story with 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 kind of a deeply humanist lens, which is to remind us that we are just people. And what I found, and this may sound odd in, in light of the series, but like my experience was all these people, whoever they were, were actually kind of trying to do their best to get through each day. Mm. And and I was surprised to feel that way. Um and 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 so I hope that we can revisit this story and remember this isn't a story of a bunch of freaks or outliers. It's a story of human beings, and right. there but for the grace of God go I. Mm. I think that's a very good way of putting it, and normally I would say let's end there, but I do have a few more questions I want to ask you. Uh, I mean, mainly, uh, what's next for you? Is it I mean, a logical step would be do something in Oklahoma City, but maybe, uh, maybe I don't know. What do you? What are your plans? Well, I, I'm I'm circling a bunch of different projects right now, and I'm uh, you know have a, a wonderful relationship with Netflix, and and will be doing a couple of more things for them, which I'm I'm very grateful to kind of have a home and have a place and and a platform to do it, and I think I'll probably do a wild swerve, something uh, <laughs> in a very different uh, key, and yeah. um. And I, I, I can't quite tell you the details of it, but I think it will be a a radical departure and kind of um, a, a refreshingly radical departure. And then and then and then we'll see what happens next. And then of course we've got uh, another series which is launching that uh, executive produced um, American Manhunt, the Boston Marathon bombing, which I which drops in next week. I think we'll be having some of them on, actually. Um, Great, in, in fantastic. The next week or two. So uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll tell them you say hello. Uh, but uh, um, I mean, back back to this thing is. So how's Netflix with that? You're going to take this uh, a, a bit of a detour from from what you've been doing. Is uh, you know, I mean, I'm not asking you to bite the hand that feeds you or anything, but uh, you know, net, it, you do you get that sort of creative license when you're working with Netflix? I, I think it's all. There's always a push and pull, right? Which yeah. is like, okay, do the you know, do what you're known for, do what you're you know, exactly. what what you've sort of had success in previously, and yet at the same time, you know, oddly, it, it oftentimes ends up like. You know, in this case, it was Netflix. Like, how about like a wild swerve? And I was like, wild swerve? That sounds super interesting. <laughs> and because uh, I think there is this tendency to, you know, I like these dramatic crime stories uh, or, or uh, because there are life and death stakes in them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether you're a cop or a criminal or, or whatever it may be, every time you step out the door – you could die. And so there's drama in that. And I think I'll always come back to them. But there's also, I guess it goes back to the kind of, you know, that humanist approach that I'm increasingly having to these to these stories, which is, okay, what's it like to be caught in history? Because no matter how big a story is or how iconic it is, it's still somebody that's putting their pants on and taking their socks mm. off, you know, just like mm. you. And so like getting down and drilling down to that, it, it almost doesn't matter what the story is when you can get at the humanity of it. And when it's all said and done, the most successful of these docs and series, they're always, I mean, for the most part, they're all character led, aren't they? Well, that that's something that I think, um, you know, 
it's it's easy to forget, right? Is it's the subject matter that brings you in. Okay, this is right. provocative. It's cult. It's you know yeah. uh, violence. It's action, and yet at the end of the day, what we connect to as human beings is character, is other people, and in the vice-like grip of incredibly dramatic situations and how do people behave when pushed to the extremes and so character is always actually the most important thing to me character and emotion and plot is actually very secondary because the plot's the engine that that gets you going but mm. what keeps you there what what haunts your consciousness what sticks in your soul is the people and so that's always the heart and soul of it to me okay i think we'll leave it there i think that's a great way to to end that uh tiller it's been a pleasure to have you on reminding our listeners and viewers that we've been talking with tiller russell the producer and director of the netflix docuseries waco american apocalypse great to have you on and uh love to have you on uh, after you've done that big swerve uh and your new project and uh, to discuss that as well Invite me back and I'll, I'll be there. Thank you so much for taking the time and interest. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the really thoughtful, um, nuanced interview questions. It was well, great. well, thank you for making the film. I really, really did appreciate it. And, uh, you know, again, would be would be great to have you on again sometime. So uh, thanks again. And we'll, we'll hopefully talk soon. Love to do it. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. See you. Bye bye. I also would like to thank those who helped make this podcast possible. A big shout out to Sam and Joe at Inner Sound Audio in York, England. A big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show and that everything otherwise runs smoothly. Finally, a big thanks to our listeners. Many of you have been with us for four incredible seasons. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. Please also remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.